um, copyrights, uh, commissions, acquisitions, intellectual property, all those kinds of issues. And our speakers have promised us lots of juicy content and outrageous issues of suing and many other things. Um, so we're very delighted to have with us today Harriet Ballock, who's a lawyer with Clyde & Co here in, in the UAE, and um, has been looking at uh, working mainly on copyright law across many different uh, sectors, but also looking at the creative industries as well. And also Daniel McLean, who's with us from, here from London, who's a very well-known uh, art lawyer working mainly in the UK. But with clients here and, and everywhere else, all over the world. And um, he really specialises in art law. Uh, he's the author of uh, Commissioning Contemporary Art with Louisa Buck, which is a fantastic book. And I'm not just saying that because it's very nice about art work. <laughs> it is nice about art work, but it's, and it's very orange. And we have a, I think Laura is just arriving, has a sample so we can wave the book around. And have a um, so maybe we'll, we're just going to open up with uh, a, a short presentation by Harriet and then switch over to Daniel giving a presentation and then we're really aiming for this to be a discussion and both of them have said to me please interrupt not only me but all of, all of you so that we just have a sort of free-flowing discussion as much as we can. Yeah? Okay, thank you. governing law, so 
So if you, you can't just tie everything up by saying this contract is governed by US law. Um, if the work's used here, you're going to have to look at local law. UA law is based, um, is based on the Egyptian law, which is based on the French code. <coughs> so like I said, very pro-artist. But if you 
for it to then sell it well. So just to point, the first, let's say for example, the gallery took the photo, so they own yeah. the copyright. In the photo. photo, well that's my last point. <laughs> <laughs> so if I take a picture of, the, of a, a work of art, you will have to get consent from me, the photographer, to use my photograph even if the subject of the photograph is in the public domain. So yeah, good point. <laughs> Um, restricted acts. Um, artists in the UAE have the right to control the exploitation of the work and it includes these rights, which includes the public performance of works and, and it's Arabic obviously is, um, this is an English translation of what the Arabic law says, but it's very wide. It's the, base, the artist has a right to control any exploitation of the work um, and it's an offence to do any of those restricted acts without permission. English law um, has its restricted acts, correct me here, Daniel, if you do, but um, the restricted acts depends on the nature of the work. So the owners of literary, dramatic, and musical works have the right to control um, the performance or um, display of their works to the public. But artistic works are not covered within that restricted act. Yeah. So if I have, if I, um, own a physical artistic work that I'm still allowed to perform, like to show it to the public because this restricted act about showing things to the public only applies to literary, dramatic or musical works. So under English law, the owner of a painting can exhibit the artworks to the public without permission from the copyright owner. That's an exploitation of the work but it's expressly permitted under English law. UAE law is quite basic and has a, just has blanket restrictions. So it has the right, you have the right to control the exploitation of the work. There's no carve out for artistic works. So there's nothing in the law that says um, the owner of the artwork has the right to display it to you know, the public. And so to mitigate that risk, you should get consent from the copyright owner if you're going to display it. You can argue by consent, obviously, if you're getting, if you're being lent a work of some art for an exhibition, um, and or just obtain sufficient warranties and indemnities saying that you're allowed to show it at your museum <coughs> or to the public in any other way. But it's just an important point to remember to address in popular contracts. This is a list of <coughs> not all, but some of the relevant permitted uses that I have um, set out. So it's basically when you can use a copyright work without getting permission. <coughs> the rights under UAE law are quite limited. Um, and you'll see that, for example, you can reproduce a single copy for personal use, but that excludes for artwork. Or you can reproduce a single copy for archiving purposes. Um, and it's limited again, so only for those purposes, preserving the original or replacing a lost copy. Can you reproduce a single copy for the purposes of criticism or review? And you can use extracts of work in audio and visual works for educational and cultural training. So the list is long and there are there are other exceptions in the law, but I just wanted to set out some that are relevant. This one's obviously going to be relevant, which is the reproduction of works of art in broadcast programmes if those works are permanently located in public, um, which obviously won't necessarily always be the case if it's just a temporary exhibition. So like I say, these rights are limited. And the rights, the rights of the press are much broader um, for newspapers or magazines to use extracts of published works. So if a work's protected by copyright, so it's not yet in the public domain, <coughs> and if your use isn't, doesn't fall within one of the limited exceptions, then you should be obtaining consent before using the image. So if you're an artist, then you need to always you should enforce that other people should be respected. Yeah, so if someone, if, if I can flip it around, so if you come across someone using your image, whether it, they've changed the image or whether they're using it in um, at, on merchandise or on the internet even, then yeah, you have the right to stop that use if, if they haven't got it. I mean, if it's being used in a newspaper and they're saying come to this exhibition or they're using picture of your image for um, to debate, debate you know, the, the, 
artist or, or some you know, the subject of your artwork, then there might be an exception. But yeah, you should be writing a letter saying, this is copyright infringement, pay me a royalty or take it down immediately. This is a problem that um, because artwork is on the internet so much, people feel like they have the right to use it, um, tweet and retweet the images, but that is copyright infringement as well. So definitely if you come across an infringement, you can you should definitely bring it to their attention and, and, and get either retrospective royalty or get them to take down the work. What about the social media like Twitter? Yeah. So, so that has to be applied that to Twitter. Well, so Twitter has terms of use which says, you know, users can tweet and retweet um, posts. But if some if someone's tweeting your image, then that's infringement and the terms of use will get around that. <coughs> so yeah, you can you can write, I mean, it, the problem is is how you find out who that person is. Um, and it suddenly gets retweeted and retweeted and everyone's tweeting it, so it's difficult to take action. So it's only the person that first... No, any or any tweet, tweet, repeated tweets will be a reproduction of your work. But I'm presuming that's in an instance when someone's using your work to illustrate something that's nothing to do with you. Yeah, yeah, or even you have the right to control any use. So even if they're reproducing it, in a way that you know might be favorable. So technically, if you go to a show and you want to tell people on Facebook and Twitter that you're at the show for like the streets, that is illegal. Well, you're reproducing an artwork. If the artwork is still protected by copyright, then yes, you have the right to control people taking reproductions, which includes photographs, of your work of art. Whether you would want to do that because it's publicity, that's a commercial decision. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's no exception to that part. There's not like some this discussion or something. Like there's there's, that. there's um, criticism or review. Yeah. So couldn't you say like it could be for criticism? It is, but you'd have to comply with the other requirements. So criticism or review or reporting on news. So you can even use it within that, provided the source and author is not mentioned. So as long as you say I'm here, it's produced by this author. But you know, this is the artist's name. Then yeah, you could find two words in there. Yeah. You know, like in English law, there's some specific exceptions for um, artwork. So, the work of art, art or architecture on public display, for example. They don't have that exception. They don't have that. So even taking, I think I might need to just project. Sorry. Um, he just the exception in the UK, which allows um, two main exceptions, which are relevant. One is for advertising artworks for sale, which benefits auction houses. So. You if you're an auction house like Christie's, you produce an Andy Warhol work without the, uh, without the permission, copyright permission, because it's for a very limited purpose. And then there's also another exception for. Hello? Hi. There's also another exception. another exception for um, works of art and sculpture and architecture that are on permanent public display. So you could make a photographic copy of them and you wouldn't have to ask the permission. Yeah, and that exception is in the French code as well, but it's not in the UAE law. So the only exception is if you're reproducing the work of art in a broadcast program, if it's permanently located in public. Um, so there's no exception otherwise. So the copyright law is very basic here. Um, it's much shorter than the French code, it's much shorter than the English um, the Copyright Sign and Patents Act in the UK as well. So we have, I'm just, you know, we have limited exceptions. It's, it's much more basic in terms of um, the internet and social media as well. So moral rights. Um, this again comes back to the distinction between the civil and common law approach. Moral rights come from France, Germany, where the laws really want to protect authors' reputation and honor. Um, common law um, laws were much slower at implementing moral rights. <coughs> but, um, and that's because the, the economic rights, people say, are more uh, predominant and more concerned in common law countries. But just a list of moral rights in the UAE. As an artist, you have the right to decide to publish the work for the first time. 
the right to be named as the author, the right to object to derogatory treatment of the work, which is very subjective. If the painting's hung in a dark corner, it's very subjective and it depends on the artist's, his opinion or her opinion. Um, and I'll see that, you can see that on the next slide. This is quite a famous moral rights case, which is, um, can you see? Sorry. Um, the flight stop installation, which was 60 East fly in formation in a shopping centre in Canada. Um, the shopping centre decorated the geese for Christmas and tied, tied ribbons, red ribbons around their necks, and the artist was horrified. Um, and his analogy was that it was like adding ear earrings to the Venus de Milo. Um, and the Canadian courts held in his favour and said, as long as the artist's view is not irrational, it should be followed. And that's unlikely to be followed in any com common law well, in the UK or in the US, um, especially in the US. But, um, you know, it may be possible that that's an interpretation of a judge here. It's, it's very subjective. There are many more rights cases. Um, I'm not aware of any. But the laws are favorable, like there's very, like the, there's no requirement to assert, you know, right paternity or anything. So you could see it happening. This is some, uh, one of the final points I wanted to cover, which is important for businesses here as opposed to maybe your artwork. Most countries, this is, um, people are quite often surprised by this, um, the ownership requirement under the copyright law, but in most countries, US and UK, if you commission a work or if a work's created by an employee, that work will be owned, can be owned by the employer, either as a result of statutory provisions. So in the UK or the US, it's like work, works for hire. I'm an employee, I create something during the course of my employment, the employer automatically owns. And in a commissioning agreement, I enter into a commissioning agreement, I create a website for you, I'll assign all copyright in the website to you. And that's you know, a standard approach in those countries. UAE law is different. Owners, the author is the owner of the work. And, and the requirements to assign that work are quite difficult. There's no automatic ownership by employee by employers. So there's just nothing in the copyright law that says anything that you create is automatically owned by your employer. So that's one thing, first of all, ruled out. And then there's a second onerous provision, which is there's no blank, you're not allowed to assign copyright in all or five or more future works. So if it's, I'll explain it again, but if the if I commission an agency to produce a website for me, there will be multiple copyright works in that website. Text, illustrations, layout. Um, so let's say there's definitely going to be five copyright works in that bundle. And I can't enter into a commissioning agreement saying, you create the website for me, and I will own copyright in that website. It has to be done retrospectively. This is a prohibition on the assignment of all artists' future works. And that comes from the French law. It's, again, very pro-artist. So can you just explain that again? Yeah. And also, what, what do you mean by works? So, so if, I, if I produce, um, so it, I'll do the, if, I can either do it like by artist. So if, if I commission an artist to create less than four works, I can enter into agreement now and say, over the next 12 months, I want you to produce four paintings for me, and, that, and I will own copyright in those paintings. That will be effective under UA law. But if I commission an artist to create five or more, or 20 artworks, and I'll display them all, and I will own copyright, and I'm wanting to own copyright in those works, that assignment will be void. So it's, I'll just read it again, but it's the assignment of copyright in all, or five or more, future works, so future copyright works, so it can be anything, paintings, um, written works, anything. But isn't that dependent on how you define the work? You mean, you just talk yeah, about the, the, it's, the it's, layers it's of work. Like layer but a, a website won't be, yeah, so if I produce, commission someone to create a song, there'll be the lyrics, the music, the performance of it, you yes. know, the, so if a designer works for a company and then produces the logo for a company, he owns well, there's no copyright, there's no automatic assignment. So unless he retrospectively signs an agreement saying that he transfers rights to the employer. So if he wants to reuse it or another thing, he can. 
well, he, well, that will be difficult because there's issues in the penal code about disclosing things you've created for your employer. Um, but for, in terms of ownership, in terms of ownership of works, um, and you may be able to argue bad faith in that as well. If you're, but um, it's an important provision. Basically, if you're drafting contracts, you have to, what I do is I get the parties to agree that after the works have been created, after um, the website's been designed, the agency will sign an agreement saying that they assign all the rights back to me, back to the business. Um, it's just a very unusual provision based on the French law. And people don't often pick it up because they're assuming the same law applies as in the UK and the US. When I was uh, an art student in, at the University of Sharjah, uh, I was producing a lot of work. I was an art student, and then I was about to put one of my put one of my works in a show, and then I was told by a, a professor at that university that had I been at any other university in the world, that as a student, technically the university owns my work, and that I should either ask for their permission or they probably have a right to get a cut from whatever I sell of any work I produce in the university. And then we had a kind of debate about that, but I, I didn't know what the UAE law was. So, well, the UAE law you'll own yourself. You will, you will own that work yourself. The laws, it, um, it depends on the terms of like the policies in other universities, but every university that I've come across, they're usually quite generous about letting, they don't usually require students or even faculty to assign copyright in their own works. There's usually an exception. Um, while they could assert copyright over it, every university IP policy that I can they they're, they're let the students own their own works. But it will depend on the policy that you've signed up to. But even under UA law, that won't be effective because it will be a future. Anything I create while I'm at your university will be owned by the university, yeah. not by law. But if you left the university and on your last day, if you, on the last day of your attendance at the university, you signed an agreement to say, I've been at the university for three years and everything I created while I was here is owned by you, then that's an effective assignment. You have to watch what you sign. Yeah. <laughs> because that's no longer a retrospective. You've already created all the works and then you're signing it. Um, so just just in that slide, just a few points to remember. Um, if you're commissioning people and you want to own copyright, get the assignment signed. Um, and this is all, this is again only UA law. So if you're looking at international um, wanting to exploit works in different countries, then this this is a basic view of UA law. Um, you might have to look at other national laws. Can you not just do it on a separate commission? Um, you could do five, but so it would be difficult for employees. Yeah. And it depends what you're commissioning someone to create. If you're commissioning someone to build a building for you, and you want to own copyright in all the designs, the design drawings, or if you, you know, it depends how big the project is. But yeah, you could do, you could do exactly that. You could say, I want you to create these four works for me. And then you just do yeah. Admin, but yeah, you could do that. So what's the, what's that?
Well, the requirements, <laughs> the requirements for a license or assignment have to be in writing. You have to specify the object, the subject of the work, the purpose of the work, the duration of the license, and which countries. I'll say I can send around the slides. So I feel like I'm going on quite a long time. This is one of my last points. Um, photographs. Anyone who takes a photograph is an interesting provision. Has um, anyone who takes a photograph of another has no right to save, exhibit, publish, or distribute the photograph without permission of the, without permission of the subject. So you have to get releases signed. Um, another person. Yeah. Another person. So if you want to show a photograph of someone, make sure the release is there. Um, or if you want to take a picture of someone, get that release signed. There are exceptions where the photograph is taken in a public place, or is a famous person, or is permitted under public interest. How famous is famous? Um, <laughs> in the UAE, everybody's famous. <laughs> I think if there's like a, um, I think if there is you know, a position of authority yeah. that people would recognize, like, you'd have to debate that your word. Sorry, if the gentleman, the photographer, yeah. If he's an artist himself, or considers himself an artist himself, and he takes pictures of a performance, yeah. and I ask him to do that. So, in the end, I have the right to use the work, because I paid him, so I have the right to use the work, his, the photograph, or the video he took. So, but uh, you have commissioned a videographer or photographer to take a picture of a play. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, of myself. Of, myself. of you, of you yourself. Yes. Yeah, you actually will have the right. I don't have it on this slide, but you, if you are the subject of the photograph or the video, you have the right to use that video even without the consent of the photographer. I don't know how you get hold of that work, the photograph, if you didn't have consent. Sorry? You, you need to get hold of the photograph or the video, but yes, you have the right mm -hmm. to use that if it's of you. Also, if you're commissioning someone to do it, there'd be an implied license that you could use it. But you should tie it up in an agreement, even a letter. And if I sell the video or the photograph? You should get I permission have... to do that. Okay, because then it's the photograph or the... He owns copyright in it. Well, you can use it for limited purposes. If you want to start selling that, that's his copyright. You need to get a license. Okay. Deadline for... Um... Like pictures taken back uh, in the 1960s. Well, the, it's the public domain for 50 years from the from the end of the year in which the photographer then died. Then the photograph would be in the public domain. So 50 years from the death of the author. author. But if he died in January, you're going to have to take it 50 years from from the end of that year. It's 50, it's 50 years. It's the period of copyright protection. After that, you can use copyright works. Yeah. I think I might be finished, just practical tips. So just to recap, if you're getting acquisition agreements or loan agreements, include the right to exhibit the physical work. Get assignments assigned, um, assignments if you want to own copyright in works you're commissioning, or don't if you're the artist. <laughs> um, ensure releases are signed by the subjects. You can use copyright notices, which have no legal effect other than just putting third parties on notice that you own copyright in, in your work and you don't want to reuse it. And again, copyright portals um, in the UAE are possible for keywords. And the last thing is, I'm doing a plug for Hyde Co's community art project. Um, we're looking for artists um, that are based in the Middle East and that want to exhibit their work. Um, We'll show the work in our offices, provide business and mentoring and legal support, and there's prizes. So if anyone wants to enter this, flyers, or if you know anyone that would be interested, just pick up the flyer at the end, or speak to Sarah at the back. It was great. <laughs>
One is, what is the artwork? Is it an original work? The second one is, who owns the artwork? The third one is, can the artwork be moved? And the fourth one is, can I copy the artwork or can I stop others from copying the artwork? And then the commission is also interesting, which I want to kind of discuss. Because um, commissions tend to be sort of leaps of faith. And there have been lots of disputes between artists and commissioners because they've been unhappy with how the commission's turned out or the commission hasn't been properly looked after by the owner. So I, I wasn't, I'm not that familiar with the laws of the UAE. It's been very helpful having your uh, discussion. And I thought it would be interesting to think about some sort of issues which are at stake, and um, particularly for the sort of legal system that's trying to think about how to deal with art and cultural property. And um, often the law has to balance rights between different types of people, between the sovereign copyright, between the creator of the artwork and the person who might to use the artwork, or in other areas, the owner of the property um, against the person who purchased the property in good faith, or the person of the country that wants to stop uh, its cultural property from leaving its territory against the free market and the, um, the rights of owners and sellers to allow property to circulate freely throughout the world. And then there's also the rights of the commissioner against the rights of the artist. So often this is about balance of rights. Um, I'm going to look also to begin with at sort of sale and purchases, some of the legal risks and particularly due diligence. So I'm going to talk a bit about authenticity. So authenticity is key to the value of the artwork. In a way, it crystallizes on a number of issues of the authorship, uniqueness, condition, provenance, where the work comes from. All of these things give uh, an artwork its value. So if you look at something like the Mona Lisa, why do we call it such huge values? Because of the myths of originality and authorship that are tied to it, and particularly its relationship to the signature. In this case, the signature of Picasso which makes it become something far more valuable than if it's not by Picasso. And it's quite interesting, Solar Witt, who's one of my favorite artists, he sold his work as drawings with certificates of authenticity. And so the wall drawing, which we've just seen, is accompanied by a certificate, which gives the owner the right to, the exclusive right to um, execute the drawing, but which confirms that he is an ownership of an authentic work. And with Solar Witt's work, you've got some sort of idea of the artwork dematerialized into a to instructions plus the certificate. But what happens if you lose the certificate? There's a case at the moment in America where Rona Hoffman Gallery in Chicago lost the certificate, so she's been sued by the collector. Um, and the collector's demanding a million dollars uh, damages. And that's quite interesting because it shows that without the certificate, even if you have the work, it's fairly meaningless. Um, I'm dealing with a dispute at the moment whether it's an allegation that the certificate has been faked. And it's probable that the sculpture that was with me certificate is a real sculpture by the artist, so you have this kind of contradictions. Um, it's quite, I'm going to talk about English law, because um, that's what I mainly specialize in. Um, and from the point of view of dealing with authenticity disputes, if you're um, trying to as a seller, as a buyer, to go after the seller who sold you a fake or a misattribution, it's actually surprisingly difficult. So the English courts take a perspective, it's called caveat emptor, which is buyer beware. And the sort of general view is that attributions of artworks are generally expressions of opinion which are not contractually binding, so they're not intended but to by the parties to be part of the contract, which might seem surprising. So if you were, uh, in this case, um, with a Van Dyke painting, this is a famous case that happened about 10 years ago, and a poor Texan collector bought this work from Agnews in London, and it was described on the sale invoice as being by Van Dyke, and the happy Texan collector Drake had an unveiling of his home in America, in Texas, and invited the chief curator from Washington to come and look at the Van Dyke. And over dinner, he unveiled it, and the curator from Washington said, look, mate, this is not by Van Dyke. So um, this led to litigation in the English courts. And in the end, um, Drake actually lost in the case, which is quite interesting because the judge said, um, Say, particularly with old master paintings, he said even though Agnews said that it was by Van Dyke, this was obviously a statement, an expression of an opinion rather than a statement of fact. They couldn't possibly have meant it to be by Van Dyke. So you don't get the million pounds back, it stays with Agnews. 
So it looks like, I mean, sorry? Can you put it in the contract? Then it becomes the contract. Well, that's a good point. I mean, if, you're, if, you, what, if you want to do as a seller, as a, as a purchaser, it may be an express term of the contract, but it means generally that you have to absolutely insist and get either a certificate or something which expressly states in that this is a warranty of authenticity. But in a normal contractual dealing, where you have, in, you know, often art world transactions are very unregulated, and that's why lawyers have become more and more popular in the art world. Or less popular, but just needed. And um, you have sale invoices. So, like, if I'm dealing with a dispute, most of the time you have a handshake and a bit of information of the sale invoice. And the so sale invoice will be not. Mind. Sorry. A big collector who knows his stuff will probably do it. Yeah, but then there's also another question here. Also, is that the more sophisticated you are as a collector, the less the law will probably help you as well, which is a kind of paradox. Because if you're deemed to have expertise, then the more you're deemed to take allocate the risk. So in this case, one of the problems with Drake was that he was being assisted by an agent who was deemed to have expertise by the court. So the court said, look, this is two experts dealing with an artwork, and therefore they know it's inherently uncertain. So if it's an express term, if it's if an express term express you'll have to make an express provision for it in the contract, and it, but it would have to be stated in a way which is not in a typical way. It would have to be expressly stated as a, as a warranty. And can it be collected then by insurance? Okay. Yes, you can, you can have insurance against that as well. Yeah. So these are two cases which involve auctioneers where there is there's in negligence there can be limited duties. In this case, which I was like, this is about the relationship between a, a vendor and an auction house. And the auction house in this case, so like to call the main messenger, has um, failed to identify these two pairs of uh, this pair of um, stubs paintings been by Stubbs, so it was sold as um, a pair of pounds by an unknown painter, and it was bought for £6,000 in the auction, and it was sold a year later for £90,000 in Christie's. So the vendor turned around and said, look, you know, you should have, you owe me a duty of care, you should have spotted that these were not, these were original works. So um, in that case, it was quite interesting because the judge said, well, actually, the auctioneer does have a limited um, duty of care, but um, this duty of care wasn't deemed to be high because it was from a provincial auction house rather than from a Christopher Sunday. So the owner of the seller of the painting lost in that case. In this case as well, it was about a buyer's time of Christie's and Christie's, Christie's <coughs> Thompson Christie's and um, Christie's had failed to notify the um, buyer that there were doubts about the authenticity of these uh, pair of urns and the court said the court sided again with the with the auction house. In this case with Egon Schiller, on this specific work, Christie's did lose because they said that um, they would accept in terms and conditions liability to Bakes. And um, it was an interesting case because a Schiller came out for auction and it was bought and the underlying painting was original, and, but the person had, somebody had copied on top of it fake signatures and also had erased half of the painting. So half was original and half was fake. And the question is, is this a fake within the meaning of Christie's terms and conditions, and Christie's were Christie's didn't satisfy the court that it wasn't within their terms and conditions, so the buyer won in that case. So basically, what the, the rule of all of this is for authenticity disputes, it's very very difficult to prove a that the work is you have a hurdle of showing that work is not authentic, and secondly, you then have to show that there's either negligence or breach of contract or fraud on the part of the person who's selling. And all of those are things that are difficult. Also, in addition, if you're a seller at work, you can rely upon um, limitation. So each country has its own limitation period. So, for example, if you're going to for England, if you breach a contract, you have to sue within six years of the breach. So this is also a problem for innocent purchasers of artworks. And this brings me on to part two, which is ownership of the artwork. Does anyone have, have any questions, actually? I feel like um, nothing at all. <laughs> So this is about, um, I re I, last year I advised the US government of, on this claim, which is about um, the return to Cambodia of a statue which was um, stolen from Cambodia in the 1960s or 70s. And it's come up for auction in some It's all on the public records of that. It was unlawfully excavated and imported cultural property belonging to a foreign country. So they've taken steps in New York to seize this object. And why I was involved in it is interesting because it's, um, it shows how international law is, I and mean, basically what happened is this work 
of, of uh, this, this statue came up for sale in the 1970s in London. So it was bought in 1975 by its current, uh, I wouldn't say owner, its current possessor, shall we say. So the person who possesses it and consigned it to Sotheby's um, bought it in the 1970s. And so English law, even though the object is in the US, English law governs whether or not where the, pro where the property was transferred, the rights in the property. And um, what this dispute re related to was whether or not the person who bought this in 1975 um, could have bought it in good faith. Because when you deal with, um, when, you, when, you, when you deal with property, you have rights as an owner of property, criminal rights, but also to, to persuade the state to bring action to help you recover your property, but you also have civil claims. And in, in, in England and America, there's a tort or a civil wrong which is called conversion. So if somebody wrongfully interferes with your property as an owner, you are able to sue that person to recover your property or damages from them. And it doesn't matter whether you're an innocent person. So this is why there are lots of disputes with auction houses. So the property goes out to an auction house and someone says, oh, that's mine. And then the auctioneer can't release it because two people are making a claim for the same object. And um, this, is, this, is, this is kind of what happened in the Coco statute dispute. So American, what America is saying is basically the Cambodians had title ownership of this property which was taken out from the country in the 1960s and title was never passed. Its ownership has never been acquired, it still belongs to the Cambodians. And what the defendant is saying is that, uh, well actually we bought it at a sale, so therefore we've got title to the property, we own it. So it's a kind of, uh, but in order for the defendant to, to be able to rely upon that defense, it has to show that it bought the property in uh, good faith. So you have to show if you're um, somebody who's bought the property that's been stolen that you acquired it as a, as a good faith purchaser under English law. And, and then, you didn't know. Well, yes, well, if you, you, or not just that you didn't know, but you didn't have any reason to believe. So it's quite interesting. It's very important for people in the art market to understand this, that particularly if they're dealers, that they can't just not ask any questions. They have to show due diligence. They have to show that they've looked into the provenance of the artwork, where it's come from, made, uh, made reasonable inquiries, checked the art loss register, for example, to find out that whether or not it could have, could have been stolen to show they're not suspicious. And um, there was a case which involved the theft of paintings by uh, D'Souza, who's an Indian artist, and the, 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 the dealer in this case, uh, Mark, lost because he basically, he, he, Dr. Kurfer, who was the original owner, sued Marx for uh, conversion of his property, and Marx said, well, of course, they were bought in good faith, and the judge said, well, actually, prove they were bought in good faith, you can't. You didn't keep any reasonable records, you, were, you, know, you just paid in cash, you didn't ask any questions. So all of those factors are relevant for that good faith. But it's quite interesting if you compare English legal system in America, all the, all the, all the legal systems relating to property um, vary from country to country, it's not international harmonization, so, England defend the English law really favours the um, the owner, so it gives the owner six years to recover their property, even when it's a good faith purchase. Whereas French law favours the good faith purchaser, Italian law favours the good faith purchaser as well. So really, what all of these property disputes relate to where the object was transferred, it gets quite complicated. Can you talk in that case with the Cambodian statue? Yeah. Just say it did get focused on the US. Is it US yeah. law? Yes, it's the Lex Citus, so yes. It's the last yes, sale. It's, it's the last sale. It's called the Law of the Place, Lex Citus. But there's a complication because sometimes the Law of the Place can be set aside for other reasons by the courts. So the US courts have been quite keep quite happy to set aside private international you know good legal requirements and let their own they just let their own laws and tight and govern. But generally like the English courts, the rule is that you have to follow what where the last transfer of ownership took place, and that's what that governs who owns the art, who owns the property. So there was a case in um, in Italy, there was a case called Woodcroft and Christie's in London, where basically I think it was a clock came up for sale and it had been stolen, and the person came forward who was the original owner. And then but what, what in that case the consignor was able to show is that the property he bought it in Italy, so Italian, and he bought it in good faith from a reputable dealer and he had no reason to doubt its uh, title. So for under Italian law, he had title to the clock, so then he was able to show that the Italian law governed the government sale and therefore he was the true owner of the clock. Is that
if this is a bit technical boring, please, uh, I'm happy to try and change it. Um, so, criminal remedies, you can also be prosecuted, but it's much easier to prove conversion as a civil plan than it is to prove to get the police to try and help you. So the only real successful prosecution I know is, which is this guy, Jonathan Toki Parry, who was a, 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 an archaeologist from Cambridge who got seduced by a sort of possibility of, of making lots of money through um, unlawfully removing uh, Egyptian antiquities. So he would conceal these Egyptian antiquities there he is, with these true kits, and he would pretend that they were, uh, he would smuggle them out of Egypt. So in that head, was this amazing head of Amun, Hotep III, who's an Egyptian god, but he sort of smuggled it out of Egypt to Switzerland, and then it was sold to, in Switzerland to collectors from around the world. Many of whom, uh, many of these works ended up in the Getty Museum, which was quite scandalous. I don't know if you've read a book called uh, Chasing Aphrodite. It's a fantastic book about the scandals of the Getty Museum, and, and, and really, uh, the Getty bought a lot of very known, and bought a lot of plundered and illegally trafficked works. Um, what happened, it was quite interesting with Getty because the Italians got hold of the director and she was in Italy and, and they faced the chief, they threatened to put her on trial and, and imprison her. So at that point, the Getty started to return Aphrodite and the other stuff to Italy, which was, it was success. Sometimes criminal remedies are quite successful. Um, so also another point which is interesting is if there's a title dispute as to who owns the work or a country says it's mine or it's, it's illegally excavated, even if the owner is able to win and vindicate their legal rights in court, they may not be able to sell the artwork afterwards. So this is the this is a, a part of a um, famous hall called the Sevso Treasure, and it's a silver a collection of silver that came from former Yugoslavia, and it led to ten years of litigation in the U.S. courts. And basically, the person who who consigned it for sale in New York is, is the, still the current owner. He's the Mark of Northampton. And his rights to the work were vindicated, but he hasn't been able to sell it since because it's sort of culturally tainted goods. So um, this has remained in uh, Bonham's in storage ever since. Um, so the other, one of the other important issues is can you move the artwork? So what, in every law, I don't know how, how this applies to the UAE, but every country has sort of export restrictions on what you can do with cultural property. And in the UK, for example, if, if, a work, if, if a work is over 50 years and it's deemed to be of artistic or historical significance and ever same value, then the Export Committee can prevent, prevent it from leaving the country temporarily. And this is what happened with Reynolds Painting. Um, they also, so I, do you have things like that here? No, I'm not aware of any export laws. I, I so that. you can take anything else in and out, in and out of the artwork. Yeah. Or antiques? No, Nothing? There are laws for antiques. And how do they work? Yeah, archaeological things that must be done. So basically, it's quite hard to move an artwork often, even if you're the owner. So you have to, because there can be national heritage restrictions, but there can also be international conventions like UNESCO and UNITWAR. And many countries now have signed up to UNESCO, which is the convention in 1970 on preventing the theft and unlawful export of cultural property. And in Europe, there's a, there are restrictions that if an artwork has been taken out of um, one EC country unlawfully, then it can get it back you know, from another country. So basically, if you're one member state, you can go to the other state or direct it to the courts and ask for it back. But if you do get asked for it back, you have to compensate the owner. So the owner gets the fair market value for one, which is quite good at least. So on to copyright, and this brings, uh, brings this sort of links to Harriet's so thought. I, I, I'm interested, for, first of all, thinking about how copyright works with art, because art, copyright protects artists, but it also potentially burdens them, because often art's based upon a system or culture of copying. And if this is just a very famous sequence of Ramonde's work being translated into Manet's Dijonet sur Herbe, and then Manet's Dijonet sur Herbe being translated into, uh, into Picasso. And if you think about applying copyright law very tyrannically, then it kind of leads to the end of art, arguably. I don't know what your thoughts are. Probably you're pro that. Yeah, we're pro yeah. copyright infringement, are we right? Yes. Yeah. Unless it's, but then there's a paradox of that because if you're an artist and your work is used in advertising, that um, a few years ago I was asked by a fishing advice to bring a case uh, for them against the makers of Honda adverts. And Honda had made this amazing advert, which was a rip off of the uh, wonderful film that Fishing Advice made, The Way Things Go 
which is filmed in a studio where all these objects interact in a kind of kinetic order. And this has been completely brilliantly uh, exploited by, by the Hamburg filmmakers, uh, Vida and Kennedy. And so uh, we didn't bring an action, which I can explain because it was very difficult to bring. But um, artists get very annoyed when they get ripped off too. Um, there's a big dispute actually on that front, just before I move on to this. Maybe the first case between artists is about to happen in Germany because Bridget Riley is accusing Tobias Rayberger of stealing one of her works from the Berlin National Library. And uh, it's leading to a big dispute. So this is quite interesting. Richard Prince has won last week. Um, he, he, as Richard Prince is a, a, a preparation artist. He infringe, infringe, you infringe a copyright in a work under any law when you copy a substantial part or a large part of it without the owner's consent. He taken photographs from Patrick Carew. Patrick Carew is a photographer. 30 images, paintings by Prince were based on works by Carew. Carew made all of these photographs of Rastafarians in a, and they've been published in a book called Yes Rasta. And um, there was a trial in New York a few years ago which Patrick Carew won. And the judge ordered the delivery up and destruction of the paintings as infringing copies. The prince has appealed, and Prince has won now on appeal, so the judges have said that 25 of the works are not infringing. And the reasons the US judges have said this is because they say that um, US, under US copyright law, you have a very generous defense for transformative use. So they say that the photographs have been transformed by um, by prints into something else, into artworks, and these artworks don't compete with the market of the photographs, they're very different works. But that's a very interesting thing because whilst this is very pro-artist, if you try and compare that with different copyright systems, it wouldn't happen in England, for example, and I don't think it would happen. I think Patrick Carew would win in the UAE, am I right? Yeah. Um, I, thought that was a, I mean, I, I only read about this, I don't know so much about it, but what I thought was really interesting is that they said that the reason that it was a completely different work of art was because of material, size, and mood. Mm. I just wondered what you <coughs> thought about that, because mood is obviously a very subjective, subjective thing. And I mean, would there ever be a case in the UAE that you know, the mood would be so different between the work that you'd appropriated and your own? They don't have that trans transformation yeah. conception, which is obviously what they're trying to hang on. Yeah. Well, the thing about the, the, the thing about US copyright law is it's based on a different rationale than UK law or French civil law, because in the US they have this idea that copyright exists to promote in as incentives. They think that should be balanced against freedom of expression, and they have very, very wide exceptions. And so they see it in a very contextual way, whereas in England it's very, very narrowly in terms of the rights of the holder. Yeah, and, and, and the fair use, for example, yeah. is an, an exception under copyright law in the US. Which is just so wide. Well, fair use also is not defined by exceptions either. In the UK, fair use is, and this is important for artists and people to understand, fair use in the UK is defined by statutory exceptions, which are very narrow. Whereas in the US, the courts have this huge freedom to use fair use, which is a flexible doctrine. And they, it's a, they, there are four factors which they can assess in deciding whether something's infringing. It's quite interesting though, because when Jeff Coons in, in this trial in 1995, 92, was sued by the, another photographer, Art Rogers, he lost that trial. And he, Coons would make the string of puppies at the top based on this photograph by Art Rogers underneath. And uh, I think the judge hated Coons because Coons was asked to talk about it, and Coons said, well, it's a parody, but it's not a parody of the photograph, because if people care about the photograph, it's a parody of society. So the judge said, well, you've got that wrong, because that's satire, that's not parody. You have to conjure up the original in the mind of the public. And, the, and Coons had also acted in bad faith because he'd removed the copyright notices from the, post, from the, uh, from the postcard when he had it copied. So, but it's also crazy, though, because if you look at the Coons work, it's so different from the um, Art Rogers. It's a sculpture, it's colorful, it's funny. I mean, real, I mean it's, it's, it's great art. But, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a strain, it's, it's difficult. I think the courts have problems in copyright when they deal with artistic disputes. But it's also a problem for the courts because in copyright law, there's this doctrine called uh, aesthetic neutrality, that courts and judges are not supposed to make judgments about what's good or bad. So like in this case, it's really crazy because the judges are basically saying, this cultural expression by uh, prints is of higher value than a photography of um, Carew, which in a way they're not supposed to do. So there's a sort of tension there. 
I don't know what, do you think photographers should have rights when artists use their work? No. <laughs> There's free appropriation. Does everyone believe that? So everyone's appropriate. Everyone's appropriate. Everyone's appropriate. Everyone's appropriate. Everyone's appropriate. Yeah, sorry. Right. Um, I guess there's a big thin limit between copying a photography, like everything, and being inspired by an art. And the limit is so thin. Well, I just wanted to say, I mean, if you if you take words or if you take a poem and then you just decide something out of it, and then you you say something about that about the time. Where this project was. Okay. Well, I just want, I mean, if you if you take a poem, for example, and then you just decide something out of it and you want to say something about the time where this poem was written, for example, if I cite something about Oscar Wilde or something and then I, I make an artwork out of that, then it becomes very valuable for the time now because it's the new artwork which is talking about something else before. And I think the same thing happens here as well. I mean, the, the value of the work both, the colored one, is to me it's much higher because it says really a lot and it has a first order of originality in it, so which is very high and it's not comparable with photography. And I think that the artist has the right to do that. So, so, the, so Karu has no originality in his work or less originality? Well, I'm very sure it's less than originality when you look at the both, but it's just. Um, it, it's a quotation. It's a he cites something, so that's fine. Would any of the photographers in the room like to? Are there any photographers in the room? <laughs> 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 I mean, it's quite interesting when you look at Carew talking the trial. He he didn't even he, he doesn't care about who the author is. He doesn't see the photographs of even having an author. And he said there were facts of nature which could just be freely copied, which is quite interesting. I think it's curious. I I define photography. If you come from the perspective of performance work, there's documentation of performance. Um, would this be considered? Uh, Photography, art photography, or to be commercial photography. I hire a producer, I hire a lot of photographers to document my work, uh, works that I produce. But you know, I'm not, I'm not the creator of this work, I just produce it. You know? This photographer isn't the. But isn't Patrick Carew considered himself to be an artist. He didn't consider himself to be a commercial photographer. And also, what's a, the other thing which is interesting is, is the actual subjects in the image. The Rastafarian subjects gave their consent to. Uh, the Karu to photograph them, but they hated the treatment by, uh, by by Prince. So they were kind of the invisible subject in this dispute. So the community of the Rastafarians were kind of interested because obviously they, they don't really have legal rights in relation to this dispute, but the, in a sort of ethical way it's quite interesting because their voice wasn't even discussed. But the sort of relationship between them as consenting subjects and Karu as a photographer was very interesting. So you have these sort of three subjects in relation to the image. You have the Karu, you have the Rastafarians, and then you have Prince doing his art. And in the end, the law has to somehow untangle this different right of these different subjects, and that gets pretty complicated. I'm not making any judgments here, by the way. But um, can I just ask you, uh, in terms of the United legal system, how yeah. do you balance copyright law with you know, freedom of expression and the First Amendment? Well, that, that's a very good point because for, I think that's what I was saying before. Freedom, freedom of expression has got a much wider protection in U.S. law. So I think that also that's why they interpret copyright law in a very, in a very open way because they try and reconcile copyright law with strong freedom of expression uh, provisions. So freedom of expression doesn't ever trump copyright law, but they try and internally give it greater weight within when the rights are being balanced, like in this case. Saying, look, look at them, look at the message, look at the audience, look at the purpose, and 
they're not reading as typical lawyers, certainly not English lawyers. English will say, English will say is, is, this, is this my property? Has a, has a substantial lot been taken? Does it fit with any exceptions? If not, boom, that's game over. I mean, I would love to do a freedom of artistic expression defense in England, but it's never been raised as a possibility yet. Someone wants to run a test case. I thought, the, um, I thought, I thought, the, I thought Christian Markley's clock might be, because none of that has confirmation. And I thought, if there's ever a great work to run a freedom of expression argument, that is it, because it's thousands of um, samples. And if you apply copyright law to that film, you would never have made the film. I mean, it took him three years making a film just in his studio. He's quite a good friend, so I go and see him a lot. Um, he'd be there persevering with all of his studio staff. And he's thinking, well, it would have taken 15, 20 years to try and get all the clearances. It's insane. So that's, Rock is a great advert of why artists perhaps shouldn't rely on copyright. Do you have any? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> Another term I would say is uh, like freedom of speech, isn't it, in a way? Because it's like a caricature of what he saw before. Yeah. So actually, some people before used to draw the king, for example, in a weird way or something, or a caricature of someone else. So he's actually just making fun of the other artworks. So I think it's in a way it's also freedom of speech to do that. It's true, and also the U.S. courts are very strong on that because there was a great case with Philip Walker de Corsier who photographed in his street photographs um, people without consent and then and then published and exhibited these and one was of this elderly Jewish man, this Hasidic Jewish guy who had this hat on and he was gravely offended and he sued Philip Walker de Corsier for breach of privacy but also for um, on, on religious grounds as well his rights to religious freedom under the First Amendment. So then his rights as religion, he said it was an idolatry, it was a graven image, it was an idolatry, it was a form of like iconoclastic image production. And the judge actually sided with Philip Walker de Corsier, again on freedom of expression grounds, but they're very US cases. I mean, if you did something sacrilegious in other contexts, I wouldn't say where, I, mean, I don't know if the freedom of expression would work so well. But how does that work here with uh, religious The privacy laws here, um, there's the publications law, which is um, quite onerous, and uh, there's the provisions in relation to photography. So if you're the subject, again, you've got the right, so you would have the right to. Um, Do you think privacy laws would trump artistic expression? Yeah, definitely. So there was a, there was an artist I think you, you met him earlier on the so what he did was he commissioned these painters in a factory in China to paint um, the portrait of the chef of the, of the ruler of Dubai so they're just beautiful humongous paintings of the ruler and, and everywhere you know you go here you'll see that image of him even on the highway what was interesting is they kind of I can't remember what ministry just before the okay. Sorry? It was actually, yeah, it was the economic department yeah. that wanted to know that they weren't making, that he wasn't making, or traffic wasn't making any money. Yeah, on the reproduction of the they, they just wanted to make sure that he wasn't making any money off that work. Because of that, yeah, he couldn't sell it. Yeah. He, he couldn't merchandise it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm not any expert on this, but this is what I understood from this, what they said is that they, um, they didn't mind that there was a, a painting of the Sheikh. They were fine with that because also the work was about um, the, the kind of reproduction of a, of a standard image and what that means. So it was, a, it was kind of slightly removed as well from that issue. But they wanted to make sure that they weren't selling those and making money from the image of, of Sheikh Mohammed. A, they, I, I don't know if any, anybody knew, but there is apparently a law that you can't do that. Even though there are obviously hundreds of street stores with stickers and uh, you know, there's a lot of um, memorabilia that is generally sold the whole time. You get permission. But I guess those they have permission. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question now. Um, yeah, do, because you yeah, yeah, please, that, please, right? yeah. It's quite curious. I mean, for me, I was just thinking, um, there was just one of those. Um, I've, I've, I've recreated the, the program that has the statue. 
And I was thinking about the, the Pearl Roundabout in Berlin, a, a kind of these Antwerp where it's actually an example of the come up that sculpture. Now, at one of those times, I was thinking, what if I, now that the thing is actually destroyed, what if I hired a Pearl, uh, and in this case, my first question is, um, what if I went up to an architecture firm out here and told them, can you draw up the plans? Make the plans, you know the dimensions, everything without them copying to me, make the plans for me, what if I sell that? Just an architectural plan to construct it again. Can I be sued by the very thing from Edge Con? If they've destroyed it, I mean, they've effectively destroyed it, and they've effectively destroyed it. Sorry, who was the original copyright owner? The, the, the person who created the design and the architecture? Yeah, but I'm guessing, again, he won. Yeah, I mean, I know it's a very really tricky thing. It's not an art placing, it's an architecture art. Are you saying because... I mean, because it's destroyed, because... They no, because copyright still exists in the original. Even if the original, if the work is destroyed, if it's been recorded somewhere and you know what the work is, the drawings will be protected. Because I, I have an interesting issue. One of the... My, uh, Mike, Michael Landy wants to make a copy of Tangley's uh, destruction machine. And the machine's destroyed. But he experienced these problems of the, there's a recording of the machine even though the machine was destroyed through mm -hmm. film, through drawing, so it's been it's been fixed because the copyright law you have to record or fix uh, the material form of the work. So if there's a if there's a if there's a recording, then there's you've got the work. Well, how old how old is the work? If it's like, when yeah. was it created? Yeah. Like eighteen yeah. So it's not really it's not really it's still being taken care of. But um, <laughs> he, I mean, sorry, just uh, as a question, that I mean, if he makes drawings from it, then he can sell the drawings or not without any um, without any problem. I'd have to check. I, I'd have to check for any law, but under UA law, architectural works are protected by copyright as well. But if I make a drawing of it, and then I want to sell the drawing, like I mean, if some people they paint the Joe Eiffel or the Burj Khalifa, for example, or whatever, okay, and then they want to sell it, then it's not possible to. Or photographs of the Bush Valley Park? They are protected works. I know it's unusual and it's very different from UK law. Um, you could copy the, if it was in the UK, you would copy the drawing, the, the, the building in public space, and then it would be fine. But in, under UA law, they do not have that exception. What if I produce this work in India? <laughs> what if I, what if I, I would do it away from somewhere it's difficult to enforce rights. So that's what I would say. So I don't know about India. You know, I, I think this doesn't. I, I think enforcement in India is Harry knows more about them. I mean, no, the, the main question out there was, as an artist, I mean, uh, I'm technically not a citizen of the UAE. So, what defines me as? Being a buy, why should I buy to a copyright law here? Like be anywhere. Because you're here, and if you're publishing work here, creating work, even if yeah. even if you're not based here, even if you're even even if you're based in the UK, live in the UK, never been to the UAE, you create work in the UK, and the work's infringed here. So even if the art firm of architecture, the architectural firm, the architect himself, UK, and you infringe copyright here, national laws will apply. So. You can't just escape by saying I'm not a national of this country. The same as a criminal law would It's, it's territorial. It's where the it's where the infringement yeah. takes place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, in Abu Dhabi, you're not allowed, even as a tourist, to take photographs of any public buildings, hotels, apartment blocks, not at all. They will arrest you. <laughs> 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 that's a criminal offence. You're not allowed. You can take photographs of yourself in the, with the background of the sea or something like that. But there's ample warning. Do they actually have a sign saying photography? Do they give you they give you notices? Do they give they have notices everywhere? I mean it's an interesting from a from a copyright point of view, it's interesting, but also it's quite interesting to see how it's used here in, in the good or in the bad way, but just to control the, the image of what you want to show up in the city. Like you never see a photo of the Bojan Arab from the season. So all these things and things that you never see. So it's it's a brand, it's a brand of the city that is controlled. Well, so and it's owned, yeah, it's owned by someone. It's owned, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Copyright law places has huge limits on what can be spoken. So if, you, if everything is copyright protected, then it limits lots of forms of speech, so including buildings. Yeah. Well, I guess it's really like a question about the spot yeah. trend of building. Is that where the interplay between copyright and design are? Well, that's very good. 
I mean, it, it varies again from country to country. I mean, in England, it's quite interesting because they try to change the, the relation between copyright and design rights are very complicated. And um, design rights last a lot longer, shorter than copyright. I mean, the maximum you can get for design is 25 years when it's registered. And if it's an unregistered right, it's three, I think three years from the date of creation. So, or it's a very limited right um, compared to copyright, which lasts for the lifetime of the author plus 70 years. So, um, in England, there were lots of, because they were trying to protect lots of designs as artistic copyrights, so the courts got fed up with this. There was a case with Star Wars a few years ago. This was a great case that George Lucas sued um, a guy called Ainsworth, who was making copies of the Star Wars helmets. Now, Ainsworth had originally worked on the, the rich set and had helped, in fact, he'd actually designed it, but he designed all his rights to Lucas films. And I think he made nine copies, and they were sold in California, there's nine copies. California. So he lost in California and there was a $10 million uh, damages award against him in California because the Americans allowed to have punitive damages. So that was, so that, so Lucas won in California and then he tried to enforce the judgment and sue for copyright infringement also in the UK because these designs were created in the 1970s. And he, um, Lucas claimed that this was a work protected by copyright, the, the, the prototype for the mask, the Star Wars mask and um, helmet. And, he lost, Lucas, Lucas lost in the court because the court said, well actually, this is not an artistic work, it's a work of design. So it changed the whole boundaries. Now lots of things that used to be protected by artistic copyright design is no longer protected anymore. So it's a kind of thing that's in flux at the moment. Yeah, I don't think we have the manual Yeah, we do. Oh, we do, the pattern school. Um, but the scope of protection on the UAE copyright is much broader than the UK. So if we have, like I said, that non exhaustive list, like a works and um, design, uh, engineering designs, there's a, it's like a really broad list, much wider, so you can fit much more into the copyright law here than you would in the UK. But they're changing, the, they're changing copyright law for design to the as well, they're trying to change the duration, well they're trying to change the duration of design so they can last longer. Okay. Quickly, just to clarify, I'm just bringing designers here as well, and artists, I guess. But we had this conversation before outside about, um, uh, you know, people who might go to see Design Days today, uh, uh, Design Days Dubai or uh, Dubai, or visit somebody, somebody's studio, make a, take a photograph, and then take that photo to their carpenter in, in Southwark and ask them to make it the equivalent for a hundred dirhams or something like that. But then um, the artist, if they or the designer happened to spot that work, they would then have the right to sue that person. But how would they prove that they were the the sole owner of that design? No, that's a very that's because, a really yeah, good question. Because presumably, you know, you that's can quite often see many artists working yeah. in yeah. similar styles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> proof is difficult, but um, they could certainly write to the copier and say, you know, I displayed my my whatever piece of um, you know, furniture or whatever it was at at Design Days. I know that it was available and I have become aware that you've infringed copyright. So it would be protected by copyright. Um, and they could definitely send a letter and chant. In my experience, sending a letter to an infringer is very effective here. Um, it's expensive to bring a copyright claim but it's rarely needed because people here are scared of infringing copyright, you know, doing something against the law. So it's usually quite effective. It's not as effective as <laughs> <laughs> And just one other question, which I guess you were touching on with the Lucas case. I mean, obviously, in, in terms of contemporary art practice, a lot of artists outsource their work as well. So artists who work in multiples or are, are working in, in a medium of them, they don't necessarily have expertise in themselves, they'll often outsource that. And a lot of uh, fashion designers, but also artists work with tailors here and you know, many other uh, kind of craftsmen. And what if that person then turned around to them and said, I saw you just sold your work in the gallery for $5,000. You know, you paid me $50 to, to make this you know, work. Whereas I, I have a right in this work. <laughs> and that's where it's really important to get the ownership document signed. So to make sure that if you are the artist and you're commissioning multiple people to help with the artwork, you get all those individuals to assign any rights to you. Um, you do have this 
there is a collective work right, which I didn't go into because I just didn't have time, but if you're the legal or personal, like the legal or natural person, so the individual that create that directed the creation of a work, then if multiple people have contributed to that work, you're the owner. But it's still best for you know to get all those assignments signed and just to make sure that you can demonstrate that you own quite hard I mean, when, they, when there are works of joint authorship. So I mean, it's very difficult because a lot of contemporary artworks are collaborations, and particularly collaborations between different, different disciplines. And I think in those situations, you have to be really clear from the outset about who the author is and who owns what. And it's probably good to have an agreement in place to reflect that understanding, because there will be lots of disputes um, when, they're, when, that's not, when that's unclear. Because some, sometimes an artist will say, actually, to the performer or even the filmmaker, well, I, I'm actually the author when the other person's executed the work and made a big creative decision about the filming or photographic depictions in the work. Uh, there was a case with Isaac Julian a few years ago. So that's, that's why I'm important to So keep interrupting. No, no, I, this is much better. It's much more fun. Um, it means it's very fun. Um, so, yeah, art and, I mean, this is all fairly similar stuff. Like, limited exceptions, parody's not an exception in England. Remedies are quite draconian, they don't just include damages, they can deliver up and destruction. It's very important to secure licenses. I think Harry explained in a lot of very good detail how copyright law works. So I'll try and come and finish on the commissions, which is one of my, before the exodus, um, <laughs> one of my pet subjects. The so commissions are interesting, because this is a commission I worked on with Klaus Oppenberg, Patricia van Brugge and then it was a great, it was at the Kistelbos Museum in Norway, which is a private garden museum, which is fantastic in Norway. The sad thing about this commission was that uh, the day Patricia was supposed to sign an agreement with Klaus, she died, which was uh, the first time and only time that's ever happened to me with a client, but the work went ahead anyway, and it's called tumbling tax, which is a really the magnifications of ski tax, which are placed on the, um, on the side of this hill. Now, this was interesting because it creates, because of, you can imagine the risks of this work, not least that if one of these falls on a member of the public and injures or kills them, who's going to be liable for it. So um, there, there are lots of complicated issues in, in structuring commissioning agreements. And I think it's, um, this, agree, this, this transaction involved four or five interlocking agreements that the commission between the artist and the Kistoffice Museum, the relationship between the structural engineer, the relationship between the manufacturer, fabricators, of the work, and, and in the end, everything had to be sort of resolved to determine these sort of questions about who's responsible for the work, what should it look like, um, who, you know, when does it get delivered, and there are, I think commissions are really interesting because I think they're one of the most exciting areas of contemporary art, and at the forefront of most of the interesting commission practices around the world going on at the moment, and if you look at somewhere like um, Belo Horizonte in Brazil, where um, Granado Paz has this extraordinary museum, which is effectively an open outdoor museum, which is full of commissions. And then Kuliak and Patrick Schopenhauer in Mexico, who's made this amazing botanical gardens. Uh, commissions are really, really interesting and important for joint sites for also the production and risk. But because they are one of the inherent risks in a commission is what are you going to get? Does an artist promise that their work is going to look like how it turns out? And I think that's where, in a sense, the law also runs into quite a lot of difficulty because lawyers try and pin things down to precise projections and rules. But in a, with a commissioning agreement, you have to have a degree of latitude because you're not defined, you're not buying a widget or a car. You're buying something which is special, made by an artist. Which can, and inherently in art, artworks are fluid, so they're always going to be changes. So one of the biggest difficulties is defining what the artwork looks like. Um, performance is also important. <coughs> It's more easy to define in terms of when is the work going to be produced, how much is it going to cost. Um, and, but when there isn't a contract, this can also lead to spectacular problems. I'll just probably explain that. Do you know the Christoph Buschel? I apologize for putting the slides, by the way. Uh, the Christoph Buschel case of Mass Monica is a classic example of what can go wrong when you don't have a contract. So I don't know if you're familiar with this case, but this was a few years ago, led to a trial in the United States. Christoph Buschel, who's a uh, very important Swiss um, artist, quite extreme in lots of ways, um, was commissioned by Massimoca to produce a work called Training Ground for Democracy. And it's a huge work which was commissioned from Massimoca's space, where they, it was intended to be a sort of um, 
a series of model villages, and the idea was to promote democratic values. It was based on the idea of taking what to transform it and infer that logic and that meaning. The problem with this commission, it was extremely expensive and there was no agreement. So within a few months, we've gone out of the budget by $300,000. And um, Boucher asked for another $300,000, and that's when he said, well, we'd love to do this, but we're running out of money. At which point, Boucher left. And he abandoned this, um, he abandoned the, um, the installation basically like this. And Massimoka was so furious that it had been abandoned and it had spent all this money that as a kind of um, sort of jive at Bouchel, they wrapped it all into a ball in and put public disclaimers on saying this is not by Bouchel and then exhibited it. And, then, and they exhibited it in the context of all their successful previous commissions. So it became a history of Massimoka. And Bouchard was so furious that he threatened them to sue them. In, in America, there's a, uh, there's a right, there's a form of legislation which is particularly for artists called the Visual Artists' Rights Act, which protects artists' moral rights. And one of those, and the moral rights as we've seen are rights which are non-economic, but which attach to the work, and which uh, are, in this, sense, in this sense, are not uh, conflict with the rights of the owner, which is Massimoka. And Bouchard argued that his, um, if they show the work in its incomplete, distorted form, that it would infringe his integrity rights. And uh, after two trials, he actually won in the United States. Well, he won, what he did is he reversed the summary judgment and on appeal, so he sent back to the court of detainment. And when he won, he abandoned the litigation. It was really weird. Um, in fact, when Massimoka won the first time, they abandoned the installation and removed it. So it's a really bizarre trial. A lot of people think it's a fake trial. Um, but Bouchard is, um, is an interesting case of what happens if you don't have a contract in place. So there are good reasons to have contracts in place. So going back, one of the other important things with commissions is not just what's agreed, but what happens after the work has been made. So what's the afterlife of the work? Whose responsibility is it to look after it? There you've got a sort of tension between the artist, the rights of the artist and the rights of the owner. I think it's important for both to have understand who's responsible for maintaining and repairing it, but also whether, for example, it should stay in this particular location. So for Richard Serra's works, Richard Serra's works are typically in situ site-specific works. It would be uh, scandalous for an owner to try and relocate one of Richard Serra's works. But that's precisely what happened in 1985 with his trial against the, the, US, the US government, with, with, which successfully in the end removed uh, tilted art from New York Federal Plaza. Do you know this trial? Yeah. <coughs> there was a, a similar case in Paris with the Marais de Colons, yeah. where the artists sued the government because um, the Colons were getting dirty, and then he wanted the government to pay for the cleaning, and the government said, we don't pay. He said, well, then I'm going to destroy it. We need to pay me for destroying my work. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, that's an interesting question. It depends about, you, you've, got, you've got a conflict there between two rights, potentially. You've got the right of what the contract says, and you've also got the moral rights of the artist, because if you show the work, it's like the, the ribbons case, if you show work in a distorted form, then you're arguably, and you don't correct that distortion, then you're infringing the moral rights of the artist. So you have to look at what the contract says, but also you've got these moral rights questions. But didn't, um, wasn't there another artist that responded to this, though, before it was taken down? There was that famous piece, and it was called Pissed Off. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, the guy who threw their shit. David yeah. Hammond did that. Yeah. He, he did Pissed Off, yeah. yeah. So basically, he, he tied two, like a pair of shoes together with a string, slung it on top, and basically called it Pissed Off. I guess he didn't quite it very much. <laughs> no, but apparently people were complaining as well because they had to walk all around there just to get yeah. to work. So it was a very long time. It was, it was, it was, that was the whole point. The wall sabotaged the space. But it was, I mean, it was deliberately provocative and divisive. But then that's also about public art should do that, arguably. Shouldn't it? Or should we all have Nicky Mouse's or sort of love something? I don't know. Technically, yeah. Can you speak? How long can the contract be for? Like, um, Anish Kapoor puts a massive thing in the middle of a city. Yeah. Can he say, <coughs> never, you can never remove it? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a, there can be long duration of the contract. I mean, you can have it indefinite. Yeah. So it can be for life. But it becomes meaningless because you need two entities to enforce it at some point in the future. That's the difficulty. So, but with commissions, there's their ongoing commitments on it. Yeah, there are no different time limitations. And even when there is a termination provision, there's sometimes clauses which survive the termination provision which give responsibility as well. So it's quite it's quite complicated how that's very And what about installations? Um, like on a smaller scale, if uh, can an artist decide um, where the installation should be? Like if the collector says he bought the work and then he says, I'm gonna put it on my wall, but the wall is like orange and the artist doesn't like it. Is the artist able to say? Well, that, that's a really good question because that goes down to how moral rights in France, for example, could prevent that, but it might not happen in England. And there's a much weaker protection. So I think in England, you may not be able to protect the context in which the work is shown. So it's the difference between structurally changing the artwork, like damaging it or showing it in a structurally modified way, and then contextual things about where you exhibit it. But then it's not, there may be something in the middle. For example, if you were a Jewish artist and your work was shown in, a, in, a, in an exhibition to promote fascism, then arguably you would be able to prevent that, even in England, as an infringement of your moral rights. So the difference about where context ends and structural changes begin is a bit can be blurred. But I think just something which didn't accord with the artist's wishes subjectively under English law, it may not be enforced because there's a sort of objective test. It tries to be the reasonable person. So the, the, there are two cases on moral rights in England which have really not favoured artists. And because the judge said, well, it's just a reasonable person wouldn't think this is a damaging to your reputation. But in France, that's very different. What does that mean? So the moral rights position in the UAE is much more generous to, to artists. So. You'd have, you'd have to be able to show, you know, you couldn't be unreasonable, I don't think, and just say, I don't like the orange wall, I much prefer the blue wall. But if it, if it was, it was always, it's more subjective. So, unlike the position in the UK, where it's anybody an objective opinion, um, the subjective opinion of the artist will be taken into account. Like the Canadian case, I, I think that would be followed as long as it's not irrational. What the artist puts in their requirements for installation, I think that's what well. they can put that in the contract. Generally, the contract's a much better place for yeah. doing it than relying on the law. Yeah, the statute. I guess so. it depends on. I mean, I, yeah, I, I know of um, an instance where an artist had had sold a work to a collector, and then the collector put it into or allowed it to be in an exhibition which was about the Arab Spring and blah blah blah, kind of a political yeah. exhibition, and the artist never made the work intending that. To, to be, that they were just chosen in that instance because they were an Arab artist, but the work was not actually ever conceived of in a political way. So they felt this was a real infringement of the way that they'd imagined their work. Well, they, they never went anywhere, but yeah, what would happen? Well, if, they considered, if they considered that to be derogatory treatment, if, if the artist thought that was derogatory treatment of his work, 
then he could assert his moral rights and bring a claim or the exhibition. And I imagine they probably comply with it. Yeah. Um, but then that, that, that creates obstacles on curatorial freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. I mean, also interpretation. I mean, I think it's a case in France where the, the estate of uh, Samuel Beckett prevented a production of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for God because it was being performed by women rather than men, which I just find crazy. But I mean, they were able to say that it was never intended that women should play these roles. So you have a production which was stopped because they infringed the alleged moral rights of the artist. We're going to true stop. I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, that, that's really, the commission to the end is the end of it, really. I just have one more question for the person. Yeah. I just have one quick question about the nature of the